Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the 12th episode of Audubon's I Saw a Bird. My name is David Ringer, and I did see a bird today. It was a ruby-throated hummingbird, which was very cool, uh, just always a great bird to see. But we're really in about the last week of their time here in New York. Uh, it's the tail end of migration, so by about a week from now, they should all be well on their way south. So nice to say goodbye to this little one today. How about you, Christine? Hey David, hey everyone. So the hummingbird is obviously an awesome bird to see, especially in New York. I recently saw a semi-palmated plover. I saw a bunch of them by the beach when it was a little warmer out. So that was also really cool to see. Very cool, great fall migrants. Well, as always, we have a terrific show lined up for you today. We are very excited for our first guest who's going to be science writer, naturalist and illustrator, Rosemary, Rosemary Moscow. Um, then we're going to take a look at fall migration, specifically hawks and other raptors, which is going to be a very fun panel. Uh, and then we're going to celebrate Latinx Heritage Month with a conversation uh, among staff and Audubon chapter leaders. So we'll close out then with one thing you can do for birds wherever you are, as we like to do every show. So we're excited to get started. And Christine, we'll turn it over to you to kick us off. Yeah, we have an awesome lineup today. So we are excited to welcome on Rosemary Moscow as our first guest this evening, as David mentioned. And Rosemary is the brains and creative power behind the very popular Bird and Moon comics. And we'll also show the book cover. Um, she's the author of books, including Birding is My Favorite Video Game. And she's also a science writer who has contributed to Audubon Magazine. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's so cool to be here. Yeah, it's so cool to see you and talk to you in person as well, because I've seen your comics um, all throughout, you know, Audubon over the past few years. Um, so we're going to start off with a hard hitting question. How did you get into okay. birds? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is such a hard question, because I feel like I've been watching birds since I was really little. It's just sort of one of those things that becomes a part of you. Um, but I, I always say that it's my mom's fault. Um, she taught me to really like, you know, the chickadees we would feed in our backyard. She would, she taught me how to flip rocks and pick up snakes and get like snake musk all over me. Um, so I think that was probably my main influence was my mom is also a big nerd. It always helps when it runs in the family. So do you have a favorite bird? I'm curious. I feel really disingenuous answering this question because it changes every week. It's like, Usually I pick an albatross species and there are what, like nine or 12 or something and I'm just gonna rotate. But I think I, I default to roseate spoonbill because they're beautiful and elegant and ridiculous at the same time. And that's kind of the vibe I go for. So yeah, I think, I think they're my Great own choice. Favorite. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You could always say the, the bird behind you as well. <laughs> That's not from you today. Yeah, I love turkey vultures too. It's one of those yeah, things, awesome. like you can't pick, you can't pick a favorite, right? Because yeah. you're just, if you're into birds, you're just constantly like beguiled by the next, you know, blue jay or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. I also have the same problem. I have a new favorite bird like every week. Um, so yeah, talking about comment, comics, why is this the medium that you choose to focus on um, when we're exploring you know, the world of birds and nature? Yeah, it seems like a weird choice, right? Um, it's not traditional, although there are more and more of us making bird comics these days, which is really cool. Uh, I think that, so I grew up reading newspaper comics, which is dating me. <laughs> you know, I would open the funnies and I read those. And so I learned that you can talk about serious subjects in comics too. Um, and they're, they're nice and short. And they're also, they're a little package that you can email and you can you know, share on social media. So they're kind of compact. So I think that's what attracts me to them is they're, they're short and sweet, I guess. That makes sense. And you know, for folks who are not familiar with your work, we're going to show some of your top comics just here in a minute because people really need to see it to understand your gift. Uh, but before we get there, I did want to pick up on something you've said in other interviews, which is that you're particularly proud of your comics that make climate change uh, more accessible to people. Can you talk about what that means for you? Oh, yeah. Um... I, yeah, so I make comics about climate change and I really try to 
um, put some, I don't know, I guess temporal or historical or environmental context to birds. I don't want to just talk about, you know, the species is cool and has always existed and will always exist. Like I want to talk about serious stuff too. The climate change ones are not my most popular, partly because they're not very funny. Uh, maybe some of them are, but like, it's just challenging. But I think like this one that you have up now, like I was just sobbing when I made this, it was really cathartic. So I think I feel like when you access something that personal in yourself, you can make something really powerful or at least really honest, I guess. But it's just, I mean, this issue is so important and it it's so hard to feel like you're you know, not alone in caring about it. Um, but I know from folks at Audubon, you all care and you're all working hard. So I think it's important to remind me and people who read my comics that it's a key issue and we all care about it. Yeah. And I think it's funny that you mentioned that some of your comics are funny because that's one of the things that I've noticed immediately with your work and I'm sure with um, a lot of our readers as well. So how has humor helped you um, in regards to science and science communication? Uh, I learned really early on that if I put um, a joke alongside any fact, no matter how incredibly boring, you know, it might seem to most people, like if I just bombard people with facts, they'll sort of back away. But if I put a joke onto it, they'll share it around. So I, I like to say that humor gives science wings, like it helps carry it to new places. So I think a lot of people feel like, you know, if you add humor, it makes things less serious and it somehow, you know, lowers it. But I feel like it actually spreads the science farther than it would normally go. And people will share, I mean, I did a comic about bogs and people shared it and I love bogs, but it was cause it was funny. It wasn't because of the bogs, sadly. <laughs> yeah, it's a tool. I, yeah, I love that notion that humor gives science wings. It's really terrific. Um, so before we dive into some more favorite comics and have you talk with them uh, a little bit. Um, we have a reader question from Lorraine who wants to know where viewers can find your comics. So we'll be dropping a link into your website, birdandmoon.com, uh, and also your book. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so let's bring up one of our all time favorite comics of yours. Um, and we know that because Audubon readers go bananas every time it goes up online. So this uh, resonates with our fans each and every time we share it. Uh, particularly every spring when there are lots of baby birds around. Um, it's really succinct, uh, but also humorous way to talk about a serious issue. Um, what, what's your inspiration for this one and what kind of response have you gotten? This is a, this is a lot older one. Uh, my handwriting has changed. <laughs> I don't think anyone would notice, but um, I can definitely see there's some spots where I, want, I really want to kern. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. You put something online and it's online forever, you know, and sometimes you want to go back and tweak it. But I, uh, my very, very first job, I guess, was volunteering at a wild bird clinic um, when I was, oh God, I must have been like 12 or something. And I saw, you know, I used to think people don't care about birds, but they really do. But that care can be misplaced sometimes. So they'll rescue fledglings and assume they're orphans, you know, and this happens all the time. So the, um, the rehab center would be inundated with fledgling birds that really need parental care. So I realized that there wasn't a good flow chart that would explain what to do if you found one. So I put this thing together. And then what I was saying before about humor giving stuff wings is I put this, this green area is just this really ridiculous thing about dromaeosaurs, you know, and like velociraptors, um, which are, you know, birds, like just like birds or dinosaurs. So that really helped this thing have more legs than it normally would. I made a version that's not funny and I send that to nonprofits too, but they always want the funny one. So <laughs> that, that feels good. Understandably so. It still makes me chuckle every time. Aww. Back away slowly. Do not. I put feet. feathers on it, which I'm really proud of, because this is something that kills me about Jurassic Park, you know, and the sequels is that they were these animals were really feathery, you know, and they're still ominous, even though they're feathery. So. 
Yes, and if anyone thinks things with feathers can't be scary, they should look at a shoe bill. <laughs> yeah, or this guy. <laughs> uh, right behind you there, yeah. Um, and by the way, for the Audubon backgrounds for all the Zoom calls, many of us find ourselves on, you can find a link in the chat. Uh, you can download some of these backgrounds and enjoy yourself. Uh, so Rosemary, another comic that you actually just put out yesterday is about window strikes. And it's a terrific resource for people curious about why birds hit their windows. Um, or who may not even realize that this is an issue. Uh, tell us a little bit about what went into this one. Yeah, this one um, I was really proud of. I, so one of my very first jobs, um, not when I was 12, was working for this group called FLAP that is out of Toronto, Canada. And they work to try to stop birds from hitting windows. And um, it was, I took a year off college. I was kind of trying to find myself and I started volunteering for FLAP and I started uh, working for them and I learned about this issue. And it's bananas. I mean, it kills billions of birds a year. It's this, uh, you know, windows are just this unbelievable threat. Um, and we just, it's hard for us to even conceive of them being a threat because they're everywhere. So, uh, so Flap reached out to me a couple weeks ago and the same people who hired me are still working there. And it was really cool to get in touch with them. You know, I don't want to say how many years later, but a lot of years later. And so, yeah, we worked together on this. This was a group effort because uh, I really wanted to make sure the science was good and the wording was good. Um, yeah, so I'm proud of this one. This is, and our goal was to say, birds, birds hitting your windows does not have to be a given. You can prevent it and you can prevent it with stuff that still makes your windows look good and is pretty easy and not too expensive. So yeah, it's something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Well, what a terrific resource. And we get that question from folks all the time. So thank you for putting this together. We'll make sure people have a link to it and can share it and take action on the recommendations. You know, this is also an issue, as you know, Rosemary, that in addition to groups like FLAP, lots of Audubon chapters work to reduce bird collisions across the country. So certainly a sad and challenging thing, like you said, up to a billion birds a year in the United States. Um, but plenty that folks can do um, in their daily lives and in their communities. Um, so here's another one that we want to take a look at. Uh, I am a birder, of course, and I'm, every day I see a bird somewhere. Um, but I want to look at this comic about birding through the four seasons. We're in a transition season right now with fall. Um, so this really speaks to me. Um, can we talk about weird duck time? What's going on here? <laughs> Okay, so making comics is really solitary, and I, <laughs> I sometimes make a joke, and I think, I'm going to put this online, and nobody's going to laugh. They're all just going to think, what is wrong with you? <laughs> but I noticed, at least where I live in the Northeast, that there are very clearly these four seasons, and everything is really elegant until you get to the sea ducks, and they're just so weird. I'm not just the sea ducks, you know, also like the lake ducks and stuff, but they're so, so, I don't want to be, be judgy, but they're, they're very alien and they often look really elegant from far away. And then you get your binoculars on them and there's like this, this crazy bill. And so, um, so yeah, I guess I was expressing something that I'd noticed about these are the four seasons um, that occur when I bird, but people identified with it and that felt really good <laughs> that it wasn't just me that noticed these wild birds. So like the, there's like scotters and uh, red-breasted merganser there and a northern shoveler, like their bill is just a few inches too long, you know, just a little, just a little long. It's kind of uncanny valley of ducks. Um, but yeah, that's- I can oh. totally relate to that. <laughs> oh yeah, so do you also go out and see the, the weird ducks? Because mm -hmm. recently I've been going to some lakes where I am in Texas and I know like yesterday I went out to a park and they were all ducks. And then like, I think that photo, that comic that you have perfectly encapsulates how they sound because I can hear them quacking just from looking at that. <laughs> um, so very accurate. Um, we have another question from a viewer. Elizabeth is wondering how many drafts do you go through before having a finished product and how much tinkering do you do with a language in your comics? Oh man, 
That really varies, but uh, I work really slow. I mean, people who um, follow me on social media for the comics, I always feel a little bad because you'll get a comic once every month or two. Um, comics, you know, my day job is writing books for kids. So comics are sort of a thing that I do because um, I'm passionate about them, but I'm just not funny more than once every month or two. <laughs> So that's about how often I come up with something. But I'm when I have an idea, I mean, I'm working on it for ages. I, I sketch stuff out. I make thumbnails. I make drafts. I edit the drafts. I show them to friends. Um, I really pour over the art and the writing and edit myself. I mean, you can go overboard, but I think I'm, I'm pretty careful because once you put something out online, people will email you and say, hey, you drew a bog turtle in a bog, but they're really found in rich fens, you know, <laughs> and, and you thought about that, but you were like, oh, I don't want to mention it, you know, and so you have to be careful. You have to kind of an anticipate what people are going to think. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty slow for a, a web cartoonist. I think a lot of them are faster, but that's just, that's just how I work. And, it, and it's fun. I, you know, I love the whole process. Yeah. And I mean, it really shows with the time that you put in, like the quality of your work that comes out. Oh, thanks. Um, but yeah, so you've written a number of stories for Audubon Magazine, as we mentioned earlier, and it is almost October. So I have a spooky question. Um, you wrote a popular article for Audubon about birding in cemeteries. Why are cemeteries sometimes good birding spots? Oh, uh, that article made me so happy to write. It's such a morbid topic, but oh, it was so neat because I got to dig into the history of cemeteries. So cemeteries used to be um, used to not be a thing. It used to be that we buried our dead, um, at least in, you know, parts of Europe, we buried them in churchyards. And these churchyards were like, not, you wouldn't go there to sit, you know, and like watch birds and eat your lunch. They were like these disease ridden places. So I think in the early 1800s, um, if I'm remembering that right, is around when we started making these beautiful garden cemeteries that were really designed to be places you would explore. So here in the Northeast, we have Mount Auburn Cemetery is kind of the classic one. And they were designed for birds. Like they were designed to draw birders, to have cool birds. There was some bird species where the type specimen was shot in Mount Auburn, which like, Thank God they don't let that happen in the cemetery anymore because that seems like, like, a, like a bad use of a cemetery. But, um, you know, people would like ride their horse carriages and have parties with their, you know, dead loved ones. And like these places just became places for animals and people. And so many of them, it's not just that they're good places to bird, it's that they were designed to be places to be outdoors and, and bird. And I can't think of anything more peaceful and nice than, you know, imagining, you know, the, the pe peaceful people and then these like warblers flying overhead. So yeah, I, I think that's it. That's not the spookiest answer for you. Um, usually cemeteries don't let you in at night, so it's not a, not a spooky pursuit. But yeah, it's more kind of a relaxing, nice thing. And good birds. Yeah. Maybe some of our viewers will give it a try during October and let us know how it goes. Thanks for those tips. Uh, before we get to our next question for you, Rosemary, our viewer, Nicole, wants to thank you for your heart, humor, and info, which is a great way to sum it up. Oh, thanks, Nicole. Thank you so much. This is such an isolated thing, like I was saying. So <sighs> it's, nice to, it's nice to hear kind words. Thank you. It means a lot. Yes, that's terrific. Uh, so, Rosemary, some of the feedback that we've heard from the drawing tutorial video series that we're doing with David Sibley um, is that many people are trying their hand at drawing, nature journaling, even things like adult coloring books during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how drawing um, other nature-based kinds of art can help people. Oof. Uh, yeah. I mean, I bought a guitar. I haven't played my guitar since I was in college <laughs> and I'm just like shredding all night. That's sort of what I'm doing. But I also, so I, I joined, I think it's Audubon California did a John Muir Laws class and I just finished doing that. So I, I get it because I'm doing it too. I think it's not just that drawing is calming, but also it lets you um, really observe something in, a, in an almost tactile way. 
So it's a way to kind of ground yourself and connect with, uh, with your experiences. And then what I would add is then take that and make the bird say something really funny <laughs> and, then, and then post it online. And then you're, you know, you're there already. So I think, yeah, I think it's really meditative and, and comforting and, and relaxing and grounding to, to do that stuff. And I mean, also, what a time to beef up your skills. I mean, watching John Muir Law's draw was just, you know, my brain was just exploding. So yeah, yeah, everybody join these classes. They're really good. Yeah, I totally agree with that in the, the meditative quality of, you know, just looking at art and creating art. Um, so thank you for sharing your art with us, Rosemary, and thank you for spending your time. This is so much fun. Um, we can't wait to see your next comic whenever it comes out. In several months. <laughs> well, stay yeah, I tuned. hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for thank having you me so on. Much. I'm such an Audubon nerd. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, uh, you, we talked a little bit about this today so far, but fall migration can mean exciting finds like warblers, shorebirds, hummingbirds. But one of the most spectacular elements of fall migration is the migration of hawks and raptors. Um, so we're very excited to start our next panel here. We're going to welcome to the show Rafael Galvez, uh, who's the director of the Florida Keys Hawk Watch and an advisory board member for Tropical Audubon and the Florida Keys Audubon Society. Uh, and also welcome Rosabel Miro, who is the executive director at Panama Audubon, which is one of our partner organizations in Panama, Central America. Welcome to the show, Rafael and Rosabel. Hola, ¿cómo están todos? Bien, gracias. Hola, hola. <laughs> Welcome. Bienvenidos. So, um, you know, Rosabel, let's start with you. Um, as some of our viewers may know, most raptors, unlike a lot of other migratory birds, cannot migrate long distances over open water. So they form these big concentrations where the land gets now narrower and where better than Panama, that land bridge between North and South America. Um, so you run one of the biggest hawk watch sites in the hemisphere at Hong Kong Hill in Panama. Tell us a little bit about that and how you do it. Oh, well, um, we have been counting raptors here in Panama City since 2004. And it's, uh, well, the, the view is from Cerro Ancon, which is our 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 site where we do the counts and that is one of the most spectacular days that was in 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 october 2011 and uh that day i was up there and i was totally excited because that was the first time ever i have seen that many raptors coming by and we know panama is very important for raptor migration we know that they come in big numbers but that particular day was spectacular. Up in Cerro Ancon, which oversees the Panama Canal, you could see a little bit down there, the, the Panama Canal uh, area. Um, we have a couple of people every day that are from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. counting raptors from October 1st to November 18th. And usually we get a, an average of 1.8 uh, million raptors in this site. But sometimes we have uh, extraordinary years where we could get in that period of time, three million, three million raptors going by this city. This is all happening above yeah. Panama City. And uh, actually one day we have in one day, two million raptors going by. So when we have those difficult dates, uh, two people are not enough up there, so we start calling volunteers to help us count the raptors. So it's That's pretty so exciting. Cool. Yeah, I love how in that video you can see like the hawks just cover the sky. So thank you for sharing that. And you can see like the energy in the, you know, in the field of people, you know, witnessing that. That's really cool. Um, so Rafael, I have a question for you. You're the director of the Florida Keys Hawk Watch Migration Project, and this is the southernmost migration count in continental US. Um, and it's also peak raptor migration right now in the Florida Keys. So I'm curious, what birds are you seeing? Well, as you mentioned, we are the only truly tropical hawk watch in the continental US. So we get to see birds that no other hawk watch really gets to see. 
Um, when we start our count in early September or sometimes even in August, uh, we focus not only on raptors, but on all migratory birds. So we document all the passages of every single species of uh, every single avian species. At the beginning of the season, we start seeing large numbers of Eastern kingbirds with gray kingbirds mixed in, large numbers of white crowned pigeons and anhingas coming over the hawk watch, large numbers of magnificent frigate birds. In terms of raptors, we, um, <clears throat> right, this is a video of a day when we saw over 400 uh, frigate birds over our site. It was just spectacular. And they were there one minute, gone the next. Um, in terms of raptors, by this time of the year, uh, late September, the kites have moved through. We get to see four kites uh, at our site. Uh, the bulk of our kites are swallowtail kites and Mississippi kites. They're, almost all of them are in South America right now. So the bread and butter at this time of year is ospreys. As Rosabel was mentioning, most raptors don't like to fly over water, but ospreys do. They're one of the few raptors that, that do uh, well over water. So our site is one of the top three sites in North America for ospreys. By the end of the season, we will have seen possibly over 3,500 ospreys. So at this point, we're about the 1,500 mark. But we've already seen 13 species of raptors at our site. So while we may not see thousands of broadwing hogs and turkey vultures like most sites in North America, our site is very unusual. We get to see a broad diversity, up to 20 species of raptors, and some raptors that don't really get represented elsewhere. So today, actually, hot off the press, we just saw our first three-digit day for peregrine falcons. 119 oh, wow. peregrines. So we've seen the bulk <laughs> of the kites come through. We've seen the bulk of the ospreys come through. And now we're starting to see diversity and we're really getting to the core of our site, which is all about falcons. What an exciting thing to watch the uh, composition of migration change through the season. Uh, Raphael, we have a viewer question from Judy who is wondering, how do scientists define a kite? Well, kites really, the term kite is very loose. So if you take it from a global perspective, and even in the US, it in, the word kite is a common term that encompasses several genera in, in various families. So they're not all related to each other. Kite really comes from the flight attitude and the style of these birds, which is, really what we use to identify them. It, at a hawk watch, it's all about learning the silhouettes and the flight styles of birds. So it applies in that term, but from a taxonomical perspective, it is a very loose term. <laughs> Thank you for that. So one of the amazing things about these journeys of hundreds or thousands of miles that birds take is how they stitch together states and countries along the way. So Rosabel, I'm wondering if you have a favorite raptor species that comes from the U.S. through Panama and keeps on going south. Um, you know, uh, uh, I like a lot uh, peregrine falcons because they are pretty, but yes. um, I would say turkey vultures. <laughs> you know, what, what happened is that when you see them, how gracefully they fly and how peaceful they are, uh, it's, it's just amazing. And the amount of events that we get here, uh, every year we get more than, in, in Cerro Ancon, we, Ancon Hill, we get to count more than 1 million uh, turkey vultures. This is the, the, the number one raptor for us here in Panama. The numbers are amazing. And, and I, I, mostly I like that, that, that they have super broad wings. They are, they are big, so they are easy to identify. And they go so easily and it's like they don't have any problem going from all the way to North America to South America. So I don't know, it's, it's just exciting when you see that many of them going by. Yeah, that's really amazing. And one of our viewers at, named Alice is asking something I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, Rosabel, which is how do you count that many birds? 
<laughs> well, we, well mo mostly it's we are estimating then. So Cerro um, Con, what we do is that we have two people, one person facing uh, one side of the, the, the Ancon Hill, north, and the other person facing south. So then, uh, then you, you get to see the, the groups coming by. And when you have too many birds, then is when you start calling volunteers. You start calling, uh, how you say this? I don't know, I don't know the exact word in English, but you call volunteers because even though if you don't know uh, how to count them, then at least you are alerting the people, hey, they are coming this way or they are coming this other way because once you have a group of people above your, your head, you usually get other groups to both sides of you and you, it's, you have to live that experience. So uh, anytime when you, you, you could come to Panama, you should come to the last week of October or the, or the first week of November, which is the time that we more or less know that the big groups are coming. So you could have easily uh, get to see 500,000 birds in one day in among those days so it's you have to go <laughs> that's amazing well, let's hope that the world's in a state where we can take you up on that and maybe do i saw a bird live on location next october yeah that's a great idea <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to come you will be very well welcome here <laughs> um so rafael you've been working on this Florida Keith Hawkwatch project for 10 years, since 2010. So have you noticed any key findings um, from monitoring these raptors over, you know, these past few years? Right, so uh, we'd have to roll the clock back a bit. Um, this video here that you're seeing, or clips from this video, are a very special day. It's sort of like the end of the story, in a sense. It was um, October 10th, 2015, when we counted 1,506 peregrine falcons that single day, all of them moving southbound. I mean, just imagine that. This is a powerful, the fastest raptor, the fastest animal on the planet, all flying like medieval arrows over you heading south. Um, but if we roll the clock back towards the beginning of the story, we wind up in the 1980s, and what's happening with the peregrine falcon at the time? It is listed at the federal and state level as an endangered species. We've seen over decades crashes of populations of peregrines, both in North America and in Europe. We have extirpated the Eastern breeding peregrine population. And myself as a young birder at the time in the early 80s, growing up thinking that I would never get to see a wild peregrine making these epic migrations along the coast. This is when a National Audubon started doing single day counts in the Keys, trying to find a place uh, where they could uh, sort of ground truth these rumors of large peregrine falcon, falcon flights along the, the Florida Keys. And they hit jackpot eventually with 129 peregrines seen in a single day. And that turned heads everywhere. Such numbers hadn't been uh, counted from uh, elsewhere, but uh, New Jersey and Virginia. Um, so the project was born from that. And from that very moment, we've seen steady increases of detected peregrine falcons from our site to the point that by 2015, as you saw in that video, we wound up counting by the end of that season, 4,559 peregrines. And it was marginally a little bit more than the prior season. Um, what explains those 1,500 birds in a single day is that we had Hurricane Joaquin raging off the Atlantic and we were worried because we were 1,200 peregrines short. They just all decided to come together that day after the storm dissipated. So what have we learned is that, um, we need to be careful about the, the pesticides that we use because still to this day, we cannot separate the term DDT, the pesticide from the peregrine falcon. Um, we're still using questionable pesticides. 
we've seen the numbers of our peregrines plateau over the la last few years. We, we may be seeing less juvenile birds, which are the bulk of our count. So we're asking questions about what's happening in their breeding grounds. Did we see the numbers peak? Is it the end? Are we going to start seeing a decline once again? So we've learned a lot, but the questions are much greater. Well, and that's the reason we can never give up hope, right? I mean, for the population to be in such dire straits and then through very concerted hard effort from a lot of caring people and organizations to have that kind of rebound is tremendous and I think should right. give all of us reason to keep going in the work that's that right. we're doing. Um, so Raphael, Carol, one of our viewers, wants to know whether there are any raptors that live in the Florida Keys year round or whether it's primarily a migration zone. Yeah, well, a lot of people are surprised to hear, going back to ospreys, that, uh, that we count that many ospreys during migration. But in the Florida Keys, we have year round ospreys. And interestingly enough, in the Middle Keys, where our site takes place, we have an unusual osprey, it's called the Ridgeways Osprey. If you look at your field guide, you may find it there at the bottom. It is the Caribbean subspecies of the osprey that has an entirely white head. It almost looks like a bald eagle. So that's one, a red shoulder hawks and Cooper's hawks are also our year round residents in the Florida Keys. But most of our 30,000 uh, raptors that we count during the fall of the 20 species, most of them are coming from the north and entirely leaving the continent during, during that season. Wow, yeah, a lot of, a lot of movement. Um, and Rosabel, we've all been finding ways to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in our personal lives and in our professional lives, um, and sometimes with a lot of overlap in between. So, of course, here at Audubon, we're doing things like I Saw a Bird, um, Audubon for Kids. Um, so at Panama Audubon, you've been doing a range of interesting activities over the last few months, including a Facebook Live program called Birding Desde Casa, uh, where you're featuring local and migratory birds. Tell us a little bit about that program and what kind of response you've got. Okay, um, because we were not um, able to go out because we were in, into a lockdown, then we decided to, we needed to keep doing things. Uh, we, the schools where we do our environmental education was, uh, we were not allowed to go to schools. So then it was like, we need to start using a social network. Um, so then uh, that's when we decided, you know what, let's start doing what we know, birds. Let's start teaching people through uh, live program using our Facebook account. So that's how we put together Verdin desde casa, uh, I don't know, uh, Verdin uh, from home. <laughs> uh, so then uh, every, every Sunday, very early in the morning when no one could go out because we were on a lockdown, we still are on, on Sundays on a lockdown, we are talking about local birds, we are talking about uh, where you could find them, and then we are even teaching people about some, some of their calls of the birds that we are using. And then that, that has been great because it has been uh, allowing us to teach what we have been learning for, for many years of birding. The program, um, two of the other people that are, are with me in the program, one is the president of Panama Audubon Society, he is one of the compilers Jana Campales of Iber, Jana Axel Cubilla, and the other person is uh, Benicio Wilson, which is uh, an Audubon member, also and a board of director member, and he is a bird guide. So all together, we just bring a little bit of happiness and knowledge to people. So it has been great because we have seen people that before were not paying that much attention to birds. Now they are, 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 getting, uh, are getting out and um, paying attention, listening to the calls. I just recently, one of the girls that has been listening to our program, watching us, she just uh, sent us this, uh, this story about, look, I, I saw this bird in this park that I always visited. And thanks to you, because you were playing a call, now I know that that bird that I've been seeing always is a common potu. And it's like, oh my God, great. So then it's, it, this is just one example of how some uh, using social media could help 
you to to be in front of the people and to be teaching people about what you care the most about what you love birds i couldn't agree more and i i love that you're also sharing with your audience the joys of birding from home, birding desde casa. Um, and that's one of the hopes that we have for the show as well, is to share the joy of birds um, from wherever people are. Um, so we have time for one last question, and this is for you both. How can partnerships between groups in Central, South, and North America help benefit birds and people? And we can start with Roosevelt and then go to Raphael. Well, uh, and years ago, uh, about eight years ago, we were fighting for protecting the Bay of Panama. And then because we have a lot of migratory, migratory shorebirds, including the Western Sunpiper, one of the most, uh, 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 the, the, one of the shorebirds that comes in big numbers here in Panama. And then it, it was obvious that we needed the support, not just the local support, but outside support. So that's how we got people and organizations from all around the world helping us, including National Audubon, help us a lot in fighting this. And, and this is just one of the examples of how you could use in cooperation could get your could get your conservation agenda going someplace. We have been also uh, working with many other partners along the Pacific flyways, uh, counting migratory shorebirds. And in that way, we are getting to know other people, other communities, organizations, and we are getting to get more ideas of how important are our sites. And the information that we are gathering is useful, is helping us to talk to, what, to our authorities, to talk to the schools, to talk to the general public about these sites are important, not just for us, for our local birds, but also for migratory birds. So cooperation among the flyways, among other organizations is very important and is necessary if you wanna continue working to protect birds. That's awesome. And we're, we're getting a lot of comments from viewers thanking both of you for the amazing work that you're both doing. Um, so Raphael, what about you? I can think of countless examples where our partnerships with other migration monitoring stations throughout the continent and the Americas really, and when I say the continent, I really mean the Americas is one. And uh, banding stations and uh, projects that are putting transmitters on birds have made a tremendous difference. We're talking about long distance migrants. This is a video, for example, that uh, we took uh, of common nighthawks, which are long distance migrants that are, their migrations are poorly known, flying past a hawk watch by the thousands. They wind up all the way in Argentina. It's like the peregrine falcons. They are breeding well north into our continent and going all the way to Southern South America. Think about all of the perils that they come against during these migratory uh, journeys two, two times a year. So um, a single peregrine falcon, for example, and we've seen this with birds that have had transmitters uh, uh, with the Southern Cross uh, Project and Bud Anderson, single bird that has flown from Northern Canada and flown over a dozen states in the US and gone over several countries in the Americas over six years of its life. It'll virtually fly over every single country in Latin America. So one year we saw that one particular bird fly over the hawk watch and many of us were just thrilled getting and connect, connecting with people that were on other sites anticipating the flight of that bird. And that bird was eventually seen in Nicaragua, Panama, Colombia, Peru, all the way down to Chile. And later in that season, I was off the coast of Lima and Peru with my brother and several other people watching peregrines migrate and thinking about how migratory birds really remind us of our trajectories and our own migrations as humans. Uh, these projects have the capacity to uh, inspire us from a recreational and, and educational perspective, unlike any other project. And it's all done through partnerships. It's all done with volunteer citizen scientists. 
and I encourage everyone to come and make a difference. It's that simple. Show up and become a volunteer. Um, tomorrow, we're doing a collaborative effort with Greenwich Audubon Center, where we're going to be uh, broadcasting our Hawk Watch live at 11 o'clock. So you can go to floridakeyshawkwatch.com and click on the events link. And you'll see us in action and see how easy it is to come and be part of the spectacle of migration, which will change your life. I guarantee it. What a great invitation. I hope lots of our viewers will take you up on that. Well, Rosa and Rafael, thank you both so much for the incredible work that you do um, and for taking some time out of your busy work and volunteer schedules to talk with us tonight. You've really inspired and uplifted our viewers and we're grateful for all you do. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. gracias. Happy Latinx Heritage <laughs> Month to everyone. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that's a great pivot to our next segment. So here in the United States, September 15th through October 15th is National Hispanic American Heritage Month, also known as Latinx Heritage Month. And here at Audubon, we celebrate with a series of events um, and storytelling throughout the Audubon Network. We'll be telling immigration stories through the lens of bird migration. We'll be highlighting various places, people, and birds from Latin America that also call the United States home. And in fact, if you follow our Instagram, Audubon Society, you can see some of the storytelling and meet some of the Audubon staff in the coming weeks. So today we're very excited to invite some colleagues and board members to talk about the celebration as well as their experiences. So please welcome to the show, Sara Fuentes, who's the board member of both the National Audubon Society and DC Audubon. Um, and the Vice President of the Government Affairs for Transportation Institute. And we're also welcoming on Refugio Mariscal, who is the Audubon Great Lakes Conservation Data Coordinator, as well as Nadia Rodriguez, the Audubon's Digital Production Coordinator. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure. Well, uh, let's get started by talking about how each of you got into birds. Uh, I know it's a different story for each one. Sada, let's start with you. Sure. So my family has always been an outdoors family. We had a purple Martin house growing up, but that was pretty much the extent of it until my parents retired and they had a lot more time on their hands. They moved out to the country and they got really into bird watching with them got really into bird watching. And I joined them on a CBC walk when I was visiting one Christmas and totally fell in love. Uh, I, there was no spark bird, like I know there is for a lot of people. I just fell in love with the process. I liked the puzzle of using different clues to figure out what the birds were. I loved how it seemed like people spoke another language and how they could identify bird calls. And I just, I just fell in love. So when I got back to DC, I looked up my local Audubon chapter so I could get more involved. It's terrific. Refugio, how about you? So I got into birds uh, sort of by accident. Um, I've always been incredibly interested in, in nature and environment. Um, that's mostly was through native plants. Um, I was really interested in native plants. I studied environmental science and geography in school. Um, before Audubon, I was a, a science social studies teacher um, in Round Lake, which is my hometown. And um, over spring break, you know, we have, we have a whole week off and I didn't have anything to do. So I went and I decided to volunteer at one of the forest preserves. Um, they have a volunteer stewardship events that they do. Um, and there I met the, who was then the vice president of the, our local Audubon chapter. Um, I was talking to him and he invited me to come to the next chapter meeting. From there, I, you know, it, it sort of got my interest a little bit. Um, I looked up some bird walks and I started, to go, started going. And from there, I was, I was hooked. Got you hooked. That's great. And Nadia, how about you? Hi, sorry, I got a little impromptu visitor there. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually, happens. It does. Um, I actually don't have the traditional birding story. I'm actually not a, a traditional birder. Um, uh, I got started to work with the Audubon Society mostly because I knew about their conservation work and that meant a lot to me and um, there's a slogan that Audubon uses that I really love which is uh, birds tell us 
And that always speaks to me, reminds me why I'm here um, and the importance of birds. And, and if you care about the environment, you have to care about birds. They do tell us. And I've learned so much from my colleagues and my time in the National Audubon Society. I love that hashtag as well, birds tell us. And I think it's so important to, to you know, reiterate that I relate to Nadia. I'm also not like a traditional birder in that sense because I can barely identify um, a lot of birds that I see, but it's, it's the beauty of, you know, sharing the space with everyone where everyone can just enjoy nature and birds in, in any capacity. So with the understanding that cultures and experiences in the United States are, of course, very varied and, and diverse, how has your relationship to birds and conservation been shaped by your Latinx identities or by your families or both? And Nadia, we can start with you. Yeah, so um, similar to a lot of um, brown and black kids um, in the United States, I grew up in a very, in a big city, I grew up in New York City, um, and we didn't really have, a lot of us don't have access to the outdoors, and it's not necessarily part of um, the culture that we grew up in, because most often than not, our parents are working um, day in, day out, just to keep food on the table, and it's really a luxury to get out there into the outdoors. Um, so I really, found a love for the outdoors as I became older as an adult and realized I wanted to find that connection. And now I realize it brings me even closer to my um, Afro-Indigenous roots. And so it brings me closer to my ancestors. And so every time I go out there, it's like being in the outdoors is like religion to me. Um, and it is the most exciting and most uh, life-changing experience every time I go out. Uh, so it's like church. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Frank Lloyd Wright here. These are not my words. Um, but it is very much like that for me. And I realize how important it is for our communities to have access to the outdoors. I love that. That's well said. Um, what about you, Refugio? So one thing that's really important to me about um, my, my heritage, my culture, is, is language. Um, I'm, uh, my first language is Spanish. Um, and I, I've been making it... Um, very purposeful to teach my, my daughter uh, the, the bird names in, in Spanish. That was helped me as well learn the names in Spanish. Um, and you know, and then, then from there we went to plants and different animals and all that. Um, so one way I really connect is through language. That's awesome. Uh, what about you, Sara? Uh, well, as I mentioned, my parents were always outdoors people. Um, they loved outdoors, they loved nature. and. I grew up pretty privileged. Both my parents were college educated on my dad's side. He's like third generation college educated. So we had a lot of opportunities. And so my parents made sure they took us to, you know, they took us to the hill country in Texas. They took us to New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada to see the outdoors. But every time we'd go, they'd say, look, we're the only Mexicans. We're the only Mexicans. Or look, we found another, there's another Latino. And that's not how it should be. You know, like Nadia said earlier, that's not really an opportunity that everybody has, but everybody should have it. Um, so I grew up very lucky with that, with that love from my parents um, and from them. But I realize that that is not usual. It's important to hear. Uh, and Sara, before we move on to our next question, we have a quick shout out from uh, a viewer named Cherise, who's a former DC Audubon Society member uh, and still is in spirit, but now lives in Sydney and Cherise says hello. Oh, great. Tell her she can buy our shirts. We got a new DC Audubon shirt. <laughs> there we go, DC Audubon shirts. Um, well, thank you, all, all three of you, for those perspectives. Um, and to keep the conversation going a little bit, Rufugio, you were talking about the importance of language uh, and bird names in Spanish with your daughter. Um, so for those who may be familiar with some Spanish bird names, uh, a lot of them are actually based on what the bird does or how it behaves rather than physical descriptions, the way a lot of English bird names are. Um, is there a, a name or two in Spanish that you really love for how it describes the bird? Yeah, there, there's two that, that come to mind. Uh, the first one, um, is because my, my daughter loves this one, she thinks it's hilarious, um, is a spotted sandpiper. Um, in Spanish, it's called playero alza colita. Uh, playero is a sandpiper, but alza colita, um, alza means to raise. And colita means butt or rear end. And so she thinks it's hilarious whenever I say playero alza colita. Um, she's, she's, she's about turning four, right? So she's right at that age. Um, <laughs> that's so she loves that one. So the bobbing motion. They, they the bob their tail like this up and down. Right? Um, and the second one, which I think is, 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 is beautiful, is uh, huicacoche casteño, which is brown thrasher. Uh, the name in, in English is awesome too, right? Brown thrasher. Um, but in, in Spanish, it's sort of a mix of, of two different languages in two different cultures. 
uh, Guigacoche is, is Nahua, and Castaño, and Castaño is, is, is Spanish, right, for brown. Uh, if you break down that Guigacoche, uh, Cuica means uh, to sing, cantar, and Cochi means dormir, to sleep. So putting those back together, it basically means the one who sings before sleeping, or in other words, the one who sings before sunset, right? And if we know brown thrashers, we know that they were super loud. They love to sing. Um, I read somewhere that it has like the, the most amount of song types of any bird in North America up to like 3,000 or something. So it's a really good and beautiful descriptive name, I think, for that bird. Uh, how yeah, wonderful. Elegant way to describe it. And as you can see, we're scrolling through the Spanish bird guide that we have on Audubon site right now. Um, so there's been a lot of public opinion surveys from places like Gallup, Pew, Yale, um, just as some examples, who consistently show that people who identify as Latinx have much higher concerns um, about the environment and climate change in general than white people who don't come from a Latinx background. So what role do you think Audubon and some of our peer organizations should play in engaging these Latinx communities? Um, and Nadia, we can start with you. Um, yeah, I think that, well, one of the reasons I think that we care so much, I don't think we care necessarily as more, right, than uh, the traditionally white uh, birders or environmentalists, it's probably a little bit louder about it because it affects our communities directly. Like, we have negative impacts in our communities if things are not done properly. We see it fast and drastically. Um, and so it's important for us to have a voice and, and use it. Um, the video that you're watching right now is a video we, we took with the Bronx um, Documentary Center. It's a, a organization, grassroots organization that works in the South Bronx, um, and it teaches children and then seniors and other people in the community uh, photojournalism. And so we took them out birding this group of kids because there's such a passion in within their groups for the for the environment. And we said, what a great connection. Let's connect birds with that. Let's remind them that birding also is easy for all of us, no matter where you are, you can find birds, you can, I don't know if you recognize him, but there's Jason Ward was actually uh, leading the walk and he's from the South Bronx and he's Afro-Latino. So it was really great also for them to see someone, see themselves represented in a birder as well. Yeah, that's an awesome organization. And it's cool to see, you know, you leading this partnership that um, Audubon is doing with them. And I'm looking forward to seeing more work in the future from, from Bronx Documentary Center. Um, so Sada, what about you? Sure. I'm really proud of the work that DC Audubon has done on this front. Um, DC Audubon has not just one, but two uh, Latinos on our board. Andres Anchano has done so much for our club. He actually translated our entire page, our website, as you can see here, himself to make it more accessible. So we're sponsoring a uh, Black and Latinx birders uh, binoculars gift and, and more. We have also uh, done our part to do a lot of outreach, right? You can't sit there and wait and hope people come to you. We've partnered with other local Hispanic organizations in DC, including Corazon Latino and Latinos Outdoors uh, to do various events. We've done a big sit, we've done bilingual bird walks, we've done tabling at festivals. So I think the onus is really on us to go, to reach out and to find people where they are and make sure that they feel included and like they can access our site and find out when the next walk is. Um, so I'm really proud of the work we've done and I've got to give a huge shout out to, to Andres for all of his work and leadership on this as well in our chapter. And a big thank you to our other board members for being so supportive. Yeah, props to him. And that's an awesome website. Um, so Refugio, you, Sara mentioned bilingual bird walks earlier, and I think you uh, led some of these bilingual bird walks as well, right? Yeah, so this year, um, through the Wild Indigo Program, which is a community engagement program um, from Audubon Great Lakes, uh, along with Mano a Mano, a paper place like County, which is two other organizations here in Lake County that do awesome work here, uh, we started planning bilingual bird walks, instead of monthly bilingual bird walks in Lake County, which is just north of Chicago. Um, because of COVID, uh, those were normally going to those those were originally going to be in in person, uh, but because of COVID, we had and we had to change things up. And instead of just you know scrapping them all together, we decided to why don't we just stream them? Um, so I go out there with my phone and just send a live stream through Facebook, and the response we got was was amazing. Um, I was expecting we get like a couple dozen people to watch tops, right? But we've gotten thousands and thousands of views um, on our streams, which is which is awesome, and, it, and I think it speaks a lot to to the need. Um, and to the interests that our communities have, right? Um, I, as I mentioned before, I'd gone on, on a bunch of uh, bird walks, but none of them, um, I don't remember a single one where it was another person of color there. 
Um, and I live in just north of Chicago. Um, I don't live in the middle of nowhere. I live just north of Chicago. Um, and so I, it, I decided, you know, um, if it wasn't me, someone who speaks Spanish, who works for Audubon, um, then who else would do it, right? So it was something that I, that I couldn't not do. Um, so we've been doing them every month. Um, the last one of the year uh, is going to be actually October 10th, um, next week. That's awesome. And I, and I love that, you know, pr providing these bird walks in a different format is just, you know, giving access to nature in a different kind of way. Um, so really looking forward to the, to the next bird walk. So thank you all three of you for your time today. It was great having you join and talk about Latinx Heritage Month. And we're looking forward to celebrating the rest of the 15 days we have, you know, and beyond. <laughs> great. Yes. Thanks for all you do. Us too. Thanks. All right. Well, as always, we like to close out our show with uh, one thing you can do for birds anywhere that you are. Um, so today we're going to talk about something uh, you can do that birds cannot do. We talk a lot about the amazing things that birds do, these long migration journeys and all kinds of other things. But one thing they cannot do is vote. You can vote. Um, so we've pulled up um, a voting information resource center that Audubon has online. We'll also uh, put a link in the chat um, and get back to the screen here in a moment. Um, so of course, you know, we have some big national races going on this year. Um, we've also got countless state and local races going on. And all of these elections matter for your communities and for birds. Uh, they have big impacts as we're seeing. And so these decision makers, whether they are national, state, or local leaders, have a lot of influence on the laws that are written about conservation, the environment, bird protection, climate change, um, and how those laws are enforced. So what we're asking you to do uh, is vote, uh, uh, sorry, pledge to vote for birds. Um, go to audubon.org slash vote. You can see what that'll look like on this page here that we've got up on screen. Um, so you can just walk through a simple set of questions to get some resources to help you make a plan to vote yourself. You can take the pledge and say, yes, I will vote for birds. Um, and then you can, uh, once you've done that, what, what you can do is invite three friends. Um, so there's an important social component to making sure that we have strong and healthy democratic elections. Um, and by you inviting three friends, once you've taken the pledge yourself, um, you can help ensure a brighter future for birds and for your communities. So if you do one thing for birds this week, we hope that you will come to this page, make a plan to vote yourself, take the pledge, and then invite three friends to do the same. Uh, so especially this year when so many things may be a little different due to the pandemic, uh, make sure that you connect with some of these resources and uh, that you know how to, how to vote yourself wherever you are. So with that, Thank you so much. Uh, I had a lot of fun tonight. We hope you did too. Christine, as I always say, you're, you're my favorite co-host. Thanks for everything. And we'll see everybody in October. Likewise, David. Thank you, everybody. See you next month. <laughs>